Hey everybody, Conscious of Economics and Urban Farm Project. Anyway, we have like the aftermath of snow. Um, still pretty chilly here. Anyway, so, you know, I'm making some changes kind of at the end of the month. Um, not really want to, you know, continue to kind of stay where I've been staying. Um, because I feel it's just really become kind of abusive and I don't really want to, um, kind of, you know, I just don't want to participate in any kind of abuse for any kind of reason. So, um, anyway, so I'm going to be, um, getting things packed up and then not really sure, um, where I'm going to be headed. So. Really hoping things will kind of align and I can finally get the land and start um, doing, you know, my long term um, farming project. So, um, so it's kind of interesting, like sometimes how biological programming is. And biological programming, you know, ends up having like several different kinds of functions, applications, you know, downloads, you know, you've got, um, you know, biologically that you've developed, you've got how your brain works, the hard drive, you have um, the interaction, right? Um, I'm just trying to think there's a better word for it, the... Um, interface, you know, like how we're interfacing with this world and all these kinds of other, you know, kind of things of how it all kind of works. And so I was like, uh, last night, you know, these, my mind keeps trying to throw up some stuff, um, about panic, you know, like, where are you going to go? You know, where, what are you going to do? Um, it might be really cold, you know, um, and uh, just watching kind of like how that plays out and, and kind of the mindset about your place in society and your value or your devalued. And, you know, listen, I'm going to upload the show from Saturday that I did with Ryan Hunter. Um, it was a super good show. Um, just about how all these systems work and... Um, where our work is and, you know, our path of development and blah, 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 blah. Super proud of Ryan. Um, if I could help a few more people like him to completely, you know, turn from being um, stuck in a mess to, you know, the sky's the unlimited and doing the good work, maybe able to turn this, you know, planet around. <laughs> Anyway, so this, this video is kind of about how that mindset plays out and how my teachings, you know, with my native teachers and um, people of power, that the fact that we have a belief system that living under the bridge and filth, um, is different than living in a mansion with swimming pool and having a private chef are different. And they're not different. They're the same. They can be um, salvation or they can be prisons. And, um, and the component is you and your, um, mindset about them. And I think it's interesting in our biological, you know, um, development, you know, destroy, conquer, consume, trample, fight with, um, 
and that your your either you know value system or your devalue system um, is arranged. So one of the things I was thinking about this morning is like you know I keep having so I went to sleep last night had really good dreams woke up kind of was sluggish and then the mind wanted to start talking about um you know panic where are you gonna go what are you gonna do um, blah 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 blah. you know um maybe you should fix things with you and the landowner you know all this kind of crazy shit, which in a power you know related situation would cause um more devaluation right because there's like some kind of begging or, you know, forgiveness or, you know, victimization, you know what I mean, that has to take place on my part um, to deal with somebody whose mindset is strictly in the system. So it's not going to happen. And we've had like a lot of, quite a few knockdown drag outs. And with him using, you know, all of, he's been trained to, to, you know, corral, beat me, threaten me, um, abuse me, you know, into some kind of submission role that he sees me in as a devalued person um, in society. So I don't, you know, the funny thing is, is like I'm not really devalued and I have to stay out of a mindset of my value and my devaluation and stay into like a neutral point um, that I'm a living being and, you know, and continue to be in balance and operating in my own power. Um, and operating in my own power is not, you know, manipulating and controlling other people, defending myself, trying to get them to see my way change. Um, standing in my own power is just assessing my journey and how I want to participate with that journey, you know, like at every given moment. And so I was thinking about like, um, how, you know, my mind, the foreign agent in my mind, right. That is the installed, um, that's an installation, you know, it's a foreign agent. It doesn't even belong to me um, through mind control and everything else and how it's like trying to talk to me about that, you know, you're going to be living under a bridge and you go help those people, you know, uh, feed them and clothe them and stuff like that. And you kind of know how, um, you know, how they live and is that what you want and blah, 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 and all these other things. And just trying to cause me a lot of heart stress today. And it's just interesting to watch, you know, how it like totally plays out. And for me, it's funny because at this point in my life, I look at, you know, living in some mansion with like a swimming pool and having nothing to do. Um, being, you know, like out of touch with the environment or the planet kind of as a, you know, a separate type of assigned prison. And that, you know, the whole thing, like got to have fake hair Got to have, you know, fake boobs, fake butt, you know, I have to work out excessively, you know, I have to, you know, do all these other things that would um, be a part of that system as well, you know, which are a whole other set of distractions from living, living my life um, in a conscious way and in, um, in, in a balance and power. So, yeah, so I was just thinking about, you know, like how interesting it is that our mind likes to try to manipulate the Fort Angel, you know, the other installation um, likes to, you know, manipulate and control and the things that it, it likes to do um, in order to get us, you know, into a place of, you know, intense suffering. Um, so that it gets us to do the things that it wants us to do, which causes our own personal power outages, which are health problems, health crises, emotional 
crises, mental crises, crises with other people, um, which are, you know, major power outages, and also um, breaking down existing um, um, power generators and things of that nature. Those, you know, those minimal things, I mean, you go into like a full ne nervous breakdown and you don't really develop or change from it. Um, you have permanently damaged power systems um, across the board. And it'll take a long time if you walk down that road to actually develop um, fixing the power systems and developing back into your spades. So it's, it, it's just like the whole thing is really, really interesting. And the only thing that you can do is really just keep pulling yourself back into the standing in the center of your power and your balance and not being triggered or hooked into um, any direction or, you know, belief systems. And, you know, it's not going to make your world better. And it's not going to make this world better. But by not participating in it, it makes the attachment to a lot of it um, not so important. And that other things that are way more important, like less distractions and more um, consciousness um, directed in the, in the ways that you actually want to direct that power and energy instead of just reacting to the outside world. And trying to get somewhere. Right? There's nowhere to get. Um, the only place that really exists is the one that's within you. So there's really nothing outside of you. I mean, it may look that way. And it may feel that way. And that's because you're looking at it with a certain set of belief systems. And you're choosing to feel a certain way about that. But there is no difference either way. I mean, I think about, you know, like Buddha and Buddha giving up, you know, food to eat as a path of enlightenment. And I think as the story goes about Buddha is that, um, you know, he went through seven teachers, right? Each teacher had kind of like their own, you know, belief system about enlightenment and how to get to enlightenment. And the last teacher he had, the seventh one, was starvation. Um, you know, getting to a place of consciousness and the path of enlightenment due to starvation. So Buddha ate one piece of rice a day. And there is a museum that has a wood carving of supposedly a bystander that saw Buddha sitting in lotus position underneath the Bodhi tree and carved what he looked like. And he was a emaciated skeleton. And after that seventh teacher, Buddha decided that, you know, a lot of these teachings were bullshit and that they created more suffering and more hardship and that feeding yourself was, you know, actually part of path of enlightenment um, and that the whole thing was not having attachments mentally, emotionally, physically or spiritually to things which means not being triggered or having emotional reactions or not allowing the foreign agent of your mind to distract you that whether you're extremely poor and dirty and filthy and freezing and starving under a bridge is somehow any different than living in a huge mansion gated with cameras and a swimming pool, you know? Um, that there is no difference between those things. The difference is, is that um, the programming and the agent in us wants us to believe that there's somehow some kind of difference between the two. And that preferably you're going to work your whole life to be on the one side and not the other side. And the harder you work towards, say, the, you know, the swimming pool and the, um, 
you know, that kind of lifestyle, the harder you work for that, the more you compromise, obligate, um, that, you know, yourself to distractions that actually never help you to fulfill, you know, like a true state of enlightenment. And more than likely, you're going to win and lose so many times trying to hold on to that mindset of better that ultimately you will end up in um, complete poverty under the bridge and you're not going to be able to handle it because it wasn't so much that you went or lost or that you did anything wrong. It was that it wasn't real in the first place, right? It was a, a foreign agent and, and a foreign application and a foreign belief system um, that goes against, you know, natural law, nature. So let me tell you kind of a story. So a friend of mine, Larry, and Larry was a homeless guy that lived in this neighborhood. And I was building an, ar an urban farm in somebody's property in this older area of Sparks. It's also where I found my girl where that whole rescue happened, but she had to rescue herself first. She jumped out of that yard and ran for her life when she was six months old. And that's when I saved her. So when she had had enough of that and she thought, well, finally outside of that fence, if I can get outside of that fence, it's going to be better. So the moment she released herself from that prison, I was able to rescue her, my doggie. And we've been together ever since. She's just so darn cute. Um, so Larry, and he lived in the neighborhood, and he lived kind of on this property that there was a fence around because the house had, like, kind of burned down, so they had to tear down the old house that was there and everything else, and there was this shed. And nobody, you know, because it had a padlock and stuff on it, nobody really knew that he lived in the shed. I mean, there was no place else for him to live. And he was having all kinds of health problems at this point. He was really having, he really had a little bike for a while. Um, he ended up going blind in one eye, having all kinds of dental problems because, you know, health problems because of kind of the life that, you know, style that he was living. But he was away from most of the homeless. And this was before, this would have, um, we became really good friends, I'm going to say, like in 2000. 10, maybe somewhere in there, maybe all this was, no, this would have been, yeah, yeah, about that. Anyway, he had been homeless for a while. He um, didn't have ID, couldn't get ID, didn't have a driver's license. He, um, you know, had nothing and he relied on cash jobs like raking and helping and it was amazing, like, how, you know, he would do a really good job for people, and people were just shitty, because he was, you know, a homeless guy, and he, he wasn't that disgusting, you know, and periodically people would let him have a shower or whatever else, and he he tried to take as best care of himself as possible, so I ended up always taking him food and things that I had, or, you know, making extra for meals or whatever else, and um, if I had a little extra cash, I'd give it to him, and um, bringing him along on my jobs and paying him as a helper and um, just other stuff. So anyway, I had this kind of interesting story and it goes along with the conversation. And uh, he said um, that, you know, one point in his life, he um, had been married three times and he had kids from each marriage. And he was a, a corporate accounting accountant. He probably made 200000 or more a year at the top of, you know, his you know, career. But he said that he was a raging alcoholic. He said that the moment that, you know, he started becoming or, you know, he was working as a corporate accountant and going up that food chain the more he had to drink in order to be able to cope with his life. And it literally his life got to where, you know, he, he would drink, he'd get off work 
maybe have business meetings or whatever midday start you know take in a few drinks go back to work um and then literally sit at a bar and drink all night and then you know meander home like three four o'clock in the morning maybe pass out not even sleep get up shower you know put on a suit and ties mind body split head back out into the world and so, you know, he would have never really had a relationship with the women that he was with. And most likely, most of them married him because of money. Obviously, you know, how do you live with somebody like that long term? And, and how do you make choices to have, you know, kids with somebody who's hammered all the time, either working or hammered? I mean, so, you know, shows you how sick, maybe even sicker the women he was married to. Or dated were than him um and so he said there was just this moment where kind of his last wife was going to take everything anyway it was a divorce and, and she was pretty much going to get everything anyway and he said that there was just this moment where he sat and he thought yeah you know, I don't have an alternative to this life that I'm living. Like, I, I don't really have, like, a an alternative plan to this life. So, um, I'm just going to let go of it all. I'm just going to stop working. And because I, I can't continue down this path, I can't continue to do what I'm doing. And the most of all, I cannot continue to drink. And so really the only option was is that, you know, he stopped drinking, so he had to quit his job because that was kind of the root of the guilt and the remorse and the shame and the obligation and the loyalty and the compromise that was really um, destroying his spirit and his body, his mind, and his emotions. Um, and the dark things that he, you know, were involved in and lying and cheating and stealing and helping companies to do this kind of stuff. And he said there was, so he just dropped out and he, because, you know, the court took his house and everything else for his third wife and the kids, um, that he, you know, just moved into his car. He didn't have anything left in the bank and, you know, game over. And the attorney still wanted a whole bunch of money from him. And now he was like obligated to pay for her attorney fees and all this other stuff. And he just was like, you know, just done. Gonna, you know, move into my car. And so, you know, he moved into his car and kind of, you know, for several months just slept in his car and just tried to cope with everything that was going on. I mean, he probably needed a huge amount of recovery time and sleep. Um, you know, to cope with what he's done to get to another side to decide what he was going to do. So, you know, he became long-term homeless and kind of was living in this shed during this time period. And, um, and he just said, you know, this is my life and, you know, I'm not going to be able to go back. I mean, what part of you're a slave to the system but you have a driver's license and you have a social security number. You have a concentration camp serial number, your, you know, social security number. He said, you know, once you get really what's going on, there's just no possibility for you to go in and choose to navigate that system. And he said, so what, $30 for a driver's license? And he goes, I've had, I haven't had one for so long. I'd have to find all these documents and I'd have to pay for all these documents and they'd probably have to get people to help me with them and all this money. And he said, and I'm barely keeping food in my mouth from, you know, what people are giving me. So how in the heck am I going to possibly be able to put that together? And, you know, it brings you to another point, like, you know, he really was free suffering with a different kind of suffering, like dealing with the cold and the environment and um, health problems because, you know, he was a devalued being in the system, but he, he was free and he was free to think what he wanted to think. And he was free to feel how he wanted to feel. 
and he was free to be how he wanted to be. And he wanted to be sober. And so if living under a bridge, being filthy and starving, um, kept him sober, then who cares? Based on making $200,000 a year and being a raging alcoholic and destroying everything and everyone and yourself. I mean, it doesn't really seem like yeah, it's a choice, I guess. I mean, the other thing, too, is like, you know, there's only, you know, once you're homeless, too, there's only so much more society is going to punish you. There's only so much that your family and friends will punish you. There's, I mean, because you lose contact with them. And so at least that whole um, abuse and devaluation and, and supportiveness, you know, ceases. Which, you know, might be the most painful of all for people to endure. I know with veterans it seems to be pretty, pretty painful. All right. So anyway, you know... Um, just like, you know, I was thinking about that mirror, you know, and it says on your side mirror, it says um, what appears in mirror may be closer than it appears, <laughs> which means like you can't even trust a mirror to appropriately um, reflect what's going on, you know, around you. You can't, you can't really trust anything. Only you can decide and make that, um, that determination. All right. Anyway, that was just the thought for today. Um, kind of a thing. And, um, and so I just thought I would put it out there because it's just stuff that I'm, you know, kind of going through right now. And my mind wants to go, oh, you only have three more weeks in the shed and on this property. And then, you know, what are you going to do? You know, what's going to happen? And, you know, um, maybe more importantly is how do I spend the last three weeks? And how do I feel about the, la the next three weeks and, and staying in a pl place of balance um, and clarity um, and not responding to everything that's going on from the outside and being able to um, just be um, for me is way more significant and of importance than what and where and how and why and should could, would, <laughs> which are all words that reflect the past and their future and don't reflect the now and being in the now and in the moment. So I just wanted to put that out there in case there's some other people that are struggling. It's not even about letting go. It's not about forgiving. That's also the past and the future it's just about being in balance in the center of your medicine um, in the sacred power spot where you belong and not stepping out from that to rock your your medicine either way and make things you know much more complicated and then you need more reactions and you need um, more solutions you know um, so you keep triggering more and more and more and the key is to just stop triggering i mean the outside world is always going to be triggered by you um, because of the foreign agent in their own mind like the matrix but um, it's up to you to stop triggering more problems for yourself, more drama, more things to react to, 
um, more things to, you know, put out, you know, or, or that kind of thing and just sit in the center. And I'm not saying you meditate all day um, or you completely check out. That's not what I'm talking about either um, because, you know, you can lose your power that way too because the seesaw becomes unstable left brain right brain left brain right brain left brain right brain internal world external world that's where you got to get off and you just got to get in the center and neutralize it all so all right anyway i hope for those out there that get it get it maybe it's a seed that'll plant um but yeah we're not changing the outside world and we're not even changing ourselves, and we're not changing the past. We're just coming into a place of balance within it all and neutrality and not feeding any of it or reacting to any of it and not being distracted. Um, but, you know, calmly centered. All right, over and out. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Oh, and um, yeah, probably pretty timely with, um, I'll upload it tomorrow, the show, Carrying Stones and Digging Holes, my radio show, um, with Ryan on it. I mean, you know, what, Thursday's Thanksgiving, so let's, let's live from a different perspective and place in the heart than, you know, we have been. Maybe make the choice to see in the center of power, um, which is the place of, you know, the heart and everything. All right. Conscious of Economics and Urban Farm Project, Bridget Lynn Dolgoff. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.